is this the best handle design ever? No, probably not. But I've been working on a blog post that looks into handles and the components of them. And over the course of this video, I'll explain how I arrived at this handle. And hopefully some of that will be useful for you. And it is a very comfortable handle. So I'm gonna start with the basics. Um, what I'll do is I'll timestamp the whole video um, and I'll link to the blog below. So if you don't want to watch the full thing or you, you want to jump to the more complicated part, then fine, but I'm going to start with basic basics. Um, so there are a few different ways of making handles. The main ones are pulled handles, extruded handles, slab built, hand built, slip cast or press molded, uh, and sometimes wheel thrown but primarily I would say that pulled and extruded handles are the most common unless you're building with slabs anyway, in which case you might slab build them. I vaguely know how to pull handles. I did a, a, a jokey video on Instagram a few weeks ago of me pulling them, but I extrude mine. And this is the extruder I use. I've got a post, uh, I've got various videos and a blog post about how I use it so I won't go into it too much here. I'm not going to try and explain all of them. There are links to people who know what they're talking about for each type um, on the blog post. But what I will do is I'm going to use the extruder now to make a few handles to demonstrate the different shapes you can use. An extruder just presses out clay into the shape of the die that you have. These are using my handle dies. This is the medium size of the standard one. I classed the types of handles in the blog post as um, a lug which is just anything sticking out that doesn't loop round and they're generally only used on small things you don't tend to see them often but i think they do count as a handle and then i would say the c shape what i call question mark shape because i can't think of a better way to describe it d shape and full loop so having a quick look at what those would actually be c shape would be one continuous curve which is easier done with wheel thrown or pulled handles, but you would have that sort of shape. I'm calling that C shape. Then question mark shape would be a curve at the top and then bending in like that. D shape would be a bend and a bend like that. And then a full loop, obviously you make a full loop and attach that to the side of the handle, the side of the mug. Those are the most common, I would say. And then in terms of sizing, obviously you can go on units of measurement, but most handles are designed for a number of fingers to go in them. So it'll be a loop and either you'll get like, that loop would be a one finger handle and then in the C or D shape, that would probably be a two. And then you could make a longer one that has three and a full hand where you've got all four fingers in and you're holding it like that. Now that would be the size that you made the handle. Obviously it's up to people to decide how they hold it. So you could have a handle like that, but someone would pick it up like that. So far, so simple, different, shapes lend themselves to different sizes so if you're pulling a handle you get a nice continuous curve which means that you are most likely to go for a question mark shape or a c shape so you would come out and bend smoothly and then either just attach back in or curve down uh, extruded handles are easy to get discrete bends on so they tend to lend themselves to the d shape although obviously you can make any shape with them. Um, slip cast handles you can do in any shape you want. But the point is that you wouldn't do a full loop in any more than one finger, ideally, just because obviously you've got a complete circle. To scale that up to the height to fit two fingers means you're scaling it up to the width of two fingers. So you wouldn't make a, a, a complete circle that would hold three or four fingers because it would be massive unless you're doing it stylistically. So you might choose to do it aesthetically, but practically it's not 
uh, a solution that most people would reach for. So the loop ones tend to be fewer fingers, which means they tend to be on smaller mugs. And if you're trying to get a whole hand in there, you kind of want the D shape where you've got a discrete bend and then a straight bit so it fits through the fingers of the hand. There are some combinations that work better than others, but as a general rule, those are your main ways of making the main shapes and the main sizes. Most mugs, I would say, are either one, two, or four fingers. A small mug would aim to have a single finger holding it. Most mugs would probably have two inside and the third finger on the outside. And I'll get onto why I think that is in a moment. Um, and then on larger mugs, you'd have a big chunky handle um, and you'd hold it with a full fist. So the next thing I talk about in the blog post is uh, attaching handles. You would score and slip typically. And the reason for that is quite simple because you tend to be working with handles and mugs in some level of dryness approaching leather hard, if not leather hard. And you might have burnished the surface or you'll have at least made, probably made the surface smoother. So clay really likes to stick to other clay. Like you can get these two cut bits of clay and you can push them together and they, they do an all right job of sticking. As they dry out, you get more of a skin and they don't want to adhere. And then once they're kind of burnished smooth, you really don't get much of a join and you have a very clear line for any stress to break along. So by scoring, what you're doing is giving a rougher surface on both sides. What you're doing by slipping is making them both a little bit wetter so the, the clay can squidge together more and you no longer have that clean break line because you've scored the surface so there's a bit of texture for it to grip onto and the slip rehydrates all of the, the thin bits that have been loosened up by the scoring. So you don't need to do both. I don't score when I do my drippy slip bits. I just press it into the clay. There's enough slip there and it dries all together enough that that's not a problem. But if you're burnishing a leather hard pot and then trying to attach something to it, you really want to score through that. As I sort of did there, if you press together lightly, you can pull them apart. If you push together and work them together, they stick. So you don't just want to score and slip, you want to score, slip, and then apply pressure, support the mug from the inside, apply pressure and give it a slight twisting action or some movement. You could either twist or slide sideways, but as you do that, you, you kind of, you intermesh them essentially because clay is made up of um, platelets and what you don't want is all the platelets aligned as they would be if you burnished it in two parallel sections that don't adhere to each other. You want them intermeshed like that. So that's the purpose of scoring and slipping. Um, that's kind of standard practice, so no big deal. The next thing is why handles fall off. The biggest problem that most people have with handles is um, to do with drying. And basically what it amounts to is that uh, clay shrinks as it dries. So you start off with a clay object a certain size and by the end of the drying process it will be depending on the clay depending on how wet it was but you're you're looking in the high single figures smaller so you might have shrunk by six eight percent something like that now obviously that's a really big deal if one thing has shrunk and the other thing hasn't so if you get a dry mug body and you attach a, a very soft handle to it that's fine but then the handle is going to want to shrink and that stress has to go somewhere. So the solution to that is really easy. You just make sure they're the same dryness. And that often means planning things and having a system for controlling the dryness. I make my handles the day before. So what I can do is I can put them on a wooden board and let them firm up just a little so they're covered. And then the next morning I can come in and I can see where they're at. And if they're dry enough, I cover them more and if they're not dry enough, I uncover them and you get an hour or two before you attach them to balance the dryness. So that would be two pieces being attached at different levels of dryness, which is a, an almost unsolvable problem. If you've done that, you've created that stress. It has to go somewhere. You can rehydrate them both to the point of being soft and then dry them together and you might get away with it, but you probably have already created a problem that's going to resolve in the handle cracking and possibly falling off. But even if you attach them at exactly the same level of dryness, 
the handle has quite an exposed surface area compared to a mug body. So this is going to want to dry, or this will dry faster in an uncovered room. Um, and there's not a huge amount you can do with that other than covering it. So I suggest making damp boxes. They are just plastic storage boxes with a layer of plaster in the bottom. The plaster can hold the water without transferring it directly into a mug where if you have a plastic base, any pooling of water will soak into the mug. The plaster holds it, but releases it into the air. So you get a box of humidity, essentially, and it means the mug and handle can't dry past the humidity that the box is at. So you can pour some water onto the plaster, put a mug in, and then leave the lid cracked slightly and the humidity will slowly drop, taking the mug and handle at the same rate. It sounds a little bit convoluted, but really it's just getting a storage box and pouring plaster into the bottom. You can do the easy version of that by just covering them with plastic. It gives you less control. It won't smooth the process for you quite so well. If there are any larger gaps, any bits that are exposed in the plastic, that bit will dry unevenly. But all in all, you know, that works. I prefer having boxes, big storage boxes with plaster in the bottom and I just dry my mugs over a few days and that should avoid the problem. This is where it gets fun. So, uh, the first thing I would say is there is a, a video by Pete Pinnell, which I link in the blog post and I will link below, where he talks about his experience with giving students handles and seeing which handles they're drawn to and why, but also he talks about what purpose a handle serves. Going into this, I had been thinking more comfortable was universally better. I wanted to see if I could figure out what would make a, the most comfortable handle I could. And he talks about how that isn't necessarily the best solution in all cases. And he raises some really good points that you might well be drinking an expensive coffee from a handmade mug. The coffee isn't necessarily the most immediately gratifying drink you could pick. You're probably drinking a coffee that's a little bit complex and maybe has some bitter notes and so on and so forth and you're savoring it and there's no reason that that shouldn't apply to the mug as well the mug shouldn't necessarily be the easiest way to get the coffee into your mouth it can be a larger part of the conversation than that and that might mean a handle that isn't immediately comfortable i think if you're going to make that distinction you have to make a, a very specific decision as to what you're doing and why. I don't think it's that's an acceptable justification for a bad handle that hasn't been well considered, but it is a very good reason to not necessarily make every single handle exactly the same and as comfortable as possible if you have a specific purpose behind not. He raises some really good points. I highly recommend the video because he explains it better than I just did. And he gives examples of times that he's used mugs that weren't the most comfortable and were really good as a result of it and changed his whole experience of drinking that drink from that mug. So watch that if you're curious. But I set out thinking I didn't really have much to say about mug handles and I, it all got a bit long winded. So you've got a mug. The mug has a center of gravity. The center of gravity is essentially somewhere near the middle part of the geometry, uh, slightly more towards the handle because obviously the handle has got some mass off to this side and the base which might well be thicker but even if it isn't obviously there's clay at the base and it's not at the top so you've got a mug center of gravity about centered a little further down a little towards the handle fine that pulls straight down no problems there the mug has a mass this would be about 300 grams this will hold about 300 350 mil of liquid so you're looking about doubling the mass once it's full and it doesn't change the center of gravity much for the large part. I mean, obviously as you tip it, it moves, but it's still not gonna move that much. It's kind of within the body and it will pull the center of gravity around a little bit, but essentially you have a point in the center of the mug that's pulling straight downwards towards the earth. When you're holding the mug like that, you've got a base of support. The center of gravity is within, it's not going anywhere. When you hold it from a point to the side, you have the center of gravity pulling straight down you have your finger pulling straight up with an equal force, but the offset creates torque around the finger. So the mug wants to hang like that. To stop it from hanging like that, 
you have to rotate it back and apply some force somewhere to stop it from doing that. So when we're holding a mug, um, you would generally hold with one finger at the top and then you would have something pushing inwards. Now, typically you would pick another finger. If it's one finger you're holding like that, if it's two fingers, you'd be holding like that. So you've got an outer finger pushing inwards and your upper finger is pulling up and out. The upwards is just supporting the mass of the mug. That doesn't change much. The inwards and the outwards are counteracting each other. So it's pushing in and in order to stop the mug moving sideways, it's pulling out. And the result of those two forces has to equal the torque around the finger or you're rotating. And that is essentially the distance between the center of gravity, this acting as a fulcrum and this one pushing in to counteract it. Now, what that means is that, I mean, just so happen to have one of these brackets lying around, which is quite a handy way of showing it. You've essentially got a seesaw or a teeter totter if you're in the States, but rather than having the mug on one side, in fact, I could demonstrate this. So you could have the mug on one side and you push down, it's not strong enough. You push down on that side and you've got leverage and obviously it's easier if the mug's there, there's less force. I mean, you can actually, this is quite a good demonstration. If you put it there, it's too flexible. It might well break if I try to do that. Leverage is literally just assuming you're in a, a stable system. Once we're balanced, you are multiplying the mass and then the distance from its center of gravity to the fulcrum and then same on this side. So I'm putting less force down than the mug is because I'm further away. If I push here, I have to push harder. Simple. This same principle, but 90 degrees. So you've got, if you put the mug here, I'm pushing with an equal force to the mug. If you put the mug here, I would have to push with a force, say four times the mug, because the distance from the fulcrum to this finger versus the distance from the fulcrum to this handle is approximately four times. Now, the interesting thing is that is true of that grip. So what that means is this mug has a mass of 300 grams, but I will be applying about a kilo's worth of force. I know Newtons would be the correct unit, but I'm not, I, I can't be bothered. Because of the relative distance, center of gravity, fulcrum, fulcrum, the point pushing inwards, the leverage is very unfavorable on this finger. So I had a mass of 750 grams. I could quite easily be putting three kilos worth of force laterally with this finger and laterally in that direction with the top finger with no resultant force. This is the relevant thing. This is all to keep it static. If you have a handle where you're pushing further down, that's nice and easy. If you design a handle where you have to have two fingers close together, you have unfavorable leverage and you are forced to apply more force with those two fingers to hold it steady for no difference in outcome. You're holding the mug steady. The amount of force these to apply, that is strictly down to the, the relationship between those points. Similarly, if you extend the handle out to here, most people don't, but I have seen stylistically extended handles. So it was there, you'd have doubled the force because you've gone from there to there and then doubled it from there to there you've doubled the force. You now have to push twice as hard as you did before. And that's already, you know, up to three, four times the, the mass of the mug. So you might be applying six kilos with that finger. Handle design makes a big difference in terms of the mechanics of it and how much force you have to apply. There is the question of what happens when you tip it to drink. And what that does is You've still got the center of gravity in the same place in the mug. Broadly speaking, I mean, if it's got liquid in, it's sloshed forward slightly, but that's the idea. But what happens is it's no longer pulling straight down. It is pulling straight down, but not relative to the mug. It's the equivalent of the force going from straight down to coming out sideways. And when you're holding the mug sideways, the resultant force wants to spin it around the handle like that. And what that means is that, again, you have the leverage of how you hold it affects how much control you have to stop it 
twisting. And you can, you've got your thumb involved here, so that helps, and you can put your thumb further out, like that, gives you mechanical advantage. That's another factor in how comfortable a handle is. When you tilt it to drink, how much it wants to twist around the handle and how easy it is to resist that. Round handles rely entirely on friction because what you're doing here is you're gripping the cross section. And when the cross section has some variation in geometry, you can stop it rotating. And you can demonstrate that in that if I hold this, it's not going to spin in my hands because it's it's very thin it's very flat i get as it twists i'm applying force here and force here to resist the twist and because of the distance between them i get some leverage and because of the cross section in order to for it to twist it has to move my hand compare that to something with a round cross section it, it's free to turn the only thing that stops it is friction Handle cross-section has an important role to play in how comfortable a handle is when it comes to uh, tilting the mug to drink and resisting that change in the resultant vector of the force. So essentially the mug weighs the same, but rather than going straight down and being in line with the handle and being easy to, to support it that way, you've twisted it, the, the force is now coming essentially out of the bottom of the mug at an angle because gravity is pulling straight down and the mug is now twisted and the handle does a worse job of resisting that force. The less of a cross section it has, the worse it will do. The other thing is obviously the surface area of the handle. Your fingers are a bone with flesh around them. So it's not as simple as the shape of the finger. It's how much of the flesh is trapped between the bone and the handle. So a handle that's straight, you're kind of squishing a portion of the finger against a handle that curves with the finger you've got a lot more flesh the bone is putting a force out in a kind of 90 degree angle and all of the tissue within that area is absorbing the pressure so there's no focus it's not focused on one spot whereas if you did it the other way around if you were applying if it was your outside finger applying the force to there it's two curves the contact point is fairly minimal so it's a lot more focused pressure even for the same handle design it hurts a lot more when the curve is against the finger rather than with it because it's not quite as simple as how much of the finger does it contact it's how much of the finger does it contact and then how much of that is it able to compress against the bone with obviously a smaller amount of flesh being compressed means that it hurts more because it's applying that force and crushing a smaller amount of tissue, you know, more pressure, it hurts more. Now, for most people, it won't reach the threshold of pain. If it's a big mug, small handle, or you've got any pre-existing condition or injury that means that you're more susceptible to feeling it as pain, it will be pain. Again, back to round handles, you have a slight and confounding thing of when you get two cylinders touching, bearing in mind the bone, you know, approximately round, round handle, the actual contact point in the middle of the two cylinders is minimal. So round handles are even worse at this. If you have a round handle that bends outwards like that and then you push it against your skin, it's focusing it on a very small amount of tissue. Cross section, again, plays a role in how the force is distributed through the finger. One other thing that is quite important, the angles of the handle when viewed from the perspective of the force that's applied to them. So I kind of demonstrated earlier that the, the mug wants to dangle with the finger in that corner. Well, that's important. I haven't quite got it clear in my head exactly what the limitations of this concept are. So I'm not sure I'm thinking about this in the right way, but the way I'm currently thinking about it is each part of the handle will have a force applied to it from a certain direction and you want that part of the handle to be rounded with the shape of the finger, forming a low point where you want the finger. Basically, what I mean by that is it wants to hang from that point. Now, if I had a C-shaped handle, there was a continuous curve like that, and that was attached to the side of the mug, then what you would have is when you, <laughs> I should, should have prepared one of these. I know what I can do. Now, the point 
is that you might want to have your finger there, but as the mug, as the mug hangs, it will slide round. As the mug wants to pivot, your hand will slide. The only thing stopping your hand sliding is friction again. So friction is kind of important for a few mug variations. I feel like you want to avoid relying on friction as much as possible. Firstly, that limits the usability of a mug for someone with limited grip strength. But also if you got your hands are wet while you're washing up, say, or you put moisturizer on, as I always have to do because the clay is currently drying out my hands and it's gonna start splitting in a second. When you hold the mug there, you're holding it as you would, you know, perfectly comfortable. It's a good, comfortable grip. I like D-shaped handles, except that the mug wants to spin round like that. And it will do that. And so you have to hold it tighter. Whereas when you've got a D-shaped handle, you don't. You can actually relax your hand because that finger, that top finger, the force that it's applying, it's applying to that handle up. And from the perspective of that force, the finger is in a low point. The finger doesn't want to go anywhere else. That's where it wants to be. When you have a hand like that, there's no low point. The hand, the finger will quite comfortably be anywhere on that handle. So the mass of the mug, the force, the rotational force it provides, it will just slide your hand through the handle if you're not holding it tightly. The last thing, I'm not gonna try and tell you all the numbers I will put up on screen. These are the approximate hand sized numbers that I have found for different ranges within which hands are commonly found. These numbers were taken from multiple sources. I didn't find a single outstanding source of data. A lot of the studies look at very specific populations for a very specific reason. And then the broader ones don't give you that much depth. So like glove sizes, for example, you can see the numbers I ended up at. Uh, they're not from a single source. They are from a variety of sources kind of mashed together and adjusted to try and make them robust for the data sets that I had. It's not ideal. I wish I'd found a single better source, but I couldn't find anything quite as universal. So these are, these are my numbers. The main thing is that there isn't a huge overlap between the numbers that you get for men's hands and women's hands. And obviously, you know, this is a, a gendered way of looking at it that the researchers use. The point really is that large hands and small hands cover a range and there isn't necessarily a size that would do both of them. If you're doing anything where size is specifically important, having the ability to have the person who's buying the mug specify the size might be a good idea or you have to specify who it's for because there's no universal size. However, 20 mil seems like a pretty good universal number for a finger. So if you're making a three finger mug, 60 mil would be good. If you're two fingers, would be 40, except that obviously on a two finger mug, one finger has to go on the outside. So you still want that to be a little bit longer than 40, but that's the kind of concept. So how do I go from all of that to this handle design? I didn't invent it. I've never used a handle with this design before. So it is new to me in that sense. My logic behind this handle is that you've got one finger there that you know is gonna be supporting the weight and applying force up and out and you know that the third finger is going to be down here applying force inwards you want to distribute the force for both of them around a curve so it's as comfortable for those fingers as possible you know approximately that when you curve your hand like that there is not a complete overlap between them they're not they don't line up and they don't completely step in so you want a step to accommodate the distance that the third finger is going to be out it's a strap handle that's quite thin and wide so that you get better rotation and also so the fingers can be closer together and you essentially end up with a nice surface area for the top finger to apply pressure a specific surface area for the third finger to apply pressure which means that it can actually push upwards as well so now this top finger doesn't have to bear the whole weight which it does when you're doing that because that third finger isn't contributing any vertical force here it can, you can actually hold the weight on the third finger and just pull inwards with that finger. So now you've got the weight shared between the two fingers. You've got a small-ish gap out, so you've minimized that leverage and maximized that leverage while still using a strong finger for the support. Your rotational support 
everything's held away from the mug far enough that you don't burn your hand. And you're just going on the fact that you know where you want the, the first and third finger and you want to cushion them. So any handle that has that approximate shape will be fine. And that means that the question mark shape of handle is the runner up. That doesn't give you such a big bend there and such a specific place to rest that third finger, but otherwise it works in a very similar way. But having a bend here that fits tightly around the finger, having a bend here that fits tightly around the finger, give you a very comfortable holding experience if you hold the mug the way I do, and if your hands are the size mine are. If you were making this for someone else, you would have to know what size their hands were. I didn't tailor this to my hand, I just went with the kind of more generic, the, the 20 mil per finger figure. I'd imagine this will work for most people. I've offered it to a few that have held it and found it comfortable with different hand sizes, but not the broadest of ranges. So you might need to adjust it for, for different groups. And then obviously different people will want to hold it differently anyway, and it doesn't really allow for you holding it any other way. That was the logic behind this handle. Um, I hadn't really stopped and thought about the forces and how they interacted before I made this. This whole blog and video has been a, a very interesting thought experiment for me, and I've learned a lot from it, and I'm thinking about handles a lot more than I was before, before I kind of had an idea of what I thought was comfortable based on the handles I'd used before. But now I'm kind of thinking about why I find them comfortable. So hopefully those thoughts will be useful for you when it comes to you thinking about what type of handles you like and why and the factors that go into it. A final note is designing for kind of inclusivity. So designing handles that don't limit the number of people that can use them, specifically people with wrist or grip or mobility issues and what you can do to make a handle comfortable. Essentially, the, the problem with a handle is the torque around the wrist, and for a lot of people, that's what makes it uncomfortable. As I said, even with a good handle, you are adding a lot of force between your two fingers just to, to keep the mug stable, and that's only because the handle's offset. If you hold it from underneath or above, you don't have that offset, you don't have that torque. But you also don't have that torque if you have two handles. So a handle on either side, you essentially put the base of support I think base is supposed to the right term. I don't know what the, the correct term is, but once you're holding from either side, you're, there's no torque because the center of gravity is within your grip. So it can't, it's not trying to spin. You're just literally holding half the weight with one hand or half the weight with the other, which makes it far easier to hold. Another thing is obviously some people hold it in their hand. Now the problem with that with a mug is that they conduct the heat too well for, for that to be comfortable with boiling liquid inside. I did a test going back a few years, but freshly boiled water, within a few seconds, the outside of the mug was at 70 C. So that's too hot to hold. You could get around that by doing a double wall or a rubber sleeve or something like that. Designing in such a way that it has no handle can be more comfortable or designing with two handles is probably better. And I'm not sure, but I, I would have thought a chunkier handle would be better because obviously the smaller it is the more you've got to grip it where a if you've got grip issues having a larger handle would probably be more comfortable but i tried to to research this i thought it would again i thought there would be like a, a central database of recommendations for designing for people with grip issues and there isn't really and there aren't many product design blogs that i found that even mention it most of the ones that come up seem to just want to sell you a second handle to attach to a mug, so that obviously is the popular solution. If you've got any thoughts on that, please comment below. If you've got, well, to be honest, if you've got any thoughts on any of it, comment below. I will put all the links in the, the description. If there's anything that didn't make sense, it's probably covered better in the blog post. But yeah, hopefully this was as interesting to hear about as it has been for me to, to work through logically. And it turned into a much deeper dive than I was expecting. I initially rejected the idea of doing even an infographic on handles because I didn't think I had anything to say. And here I am about an hour later still talking. So I'm going to call it quits there. Uh, let me know what you think.